In this presentation, I will show you how to use a simulation tool that has been developed in our ADML research lab to simulate the material thermal and mechanical behavior during laser powder bed filling process. Like most other commonly used FEA software, we divide the simulation process into three major steps, pre-processing, processing, and post-processing. The first important thing we need to do is the preparation of initial cost mesh. There are two ways to generate a cost mesh for this simulation tool. For simple part model, we can use due to the internal functions directly, and for complex part model, we may use other tools like GMesh to generate a cost mesh. Most of the time, the simulation domain is simple enough that we can use Dutu's internal uh, mesh generation functions to generate this mesh like a cubic a sphere, truncated cone, rectangular domain with cheese pattern, a, and a channel with a cylinder, and so on. I will not explain how to use these functions here as they are explained in detail in the Dutu's website. You can find how to create a mesh by searching the grid generator class. Here I mainly talk a little bit about how to use GMesh to create a cost mesh with complex shapes that cannot be generated through DO2's internal functions. For complex part model, we can use different tools like GMesh, Qubit, Lagrid to generate the mesh, and DO2 has an interface to import this external mesh file. Here I will simply describe a general workflow using GMesh. So GMesh is the smallest and most quickly set up open source tool we can use to generate a mesh that consists of a quadrilateral or hexahedral element. I will take an example to show how to generate a .msh format file that DO2 can read in. Two steps are required. The first step is to create a geometry model, and the second is to create a mesh model based on the geometry model. In GMesh, a mesh is described in a text-based .go file that contains computations, loops, variables, and so on. We can use text editor to open it. So, and in this file, we can see that the mesh is generated from a surface representation, which is built a from a list of line loops, which is built from a list of lines, which are in turn built from points. So the .go script can be written and edited by hand, or it can be generated automatically by creating objects graphically inside the GMesh. The file can be easily edited by pressing reload or edit under the geometry tab. The modification or edit of this file is very flexible. We can edit the .go file directly, or we can use its GUI to edit the geometry model interactively. In many cases, it is best to combine both approaches. So this is the procedures to create or edit a geometry model. After the geometry model is ready, we can switch to mesh model We can switch to mesh model and then uh, click on the 3D mesh. Then it can generate a desired mesh as expected. If it fails to generate a mesh as you expected, you may need to go back to the .go file and make some modifications. We can also check the number of node and element by clicking this statistics button here. It shows the basic information of the geometry model and mesh model. And then finally we finally we save the mesh to a file. And then this this is the file uh, this is the cost mesh file with dot msh format that we want to simulate using our developed FE code. Next step is to define the temperature dependent material property file. The properties of powder material are quite different compared with the properties of solid material at the same temperature. 
itself undergoes three different material phases during the melting and the solidification process. Thus, a mechanism needs to be established to indicate which material phase of a cell at a certain temperature. The rule of material phase transition is illustrated in this figure. Specifically, the initial powder material is first converted to melted liquid when the temperature is increased to its melting point. Then the liquid material solidifies when the temperature cools down to room temperature. After that, the solidified material can be remelted and resolidified when neighbor scanning tracks are heated. Material thermal and the mechanical properties vary as temperature changes. However, it is not easy to illustrate the relationship between material property and the temperature during the simulation process. In this research, these material properties are modeled as piece functions of temperature, as shown in this equation. In this equation, M stands for material property, P indicate powder, sol solid, or liquid material type, and Q indicate the in estimated material property like the thermal conductivity, specific heat, loss modulus, and so on. Now here is an example of material properties defined in the parameters.prm file. Next, I would like to simply explain the definition of this material file. We can open this property file in Eclipse. The head section is the definition of constant process parameters like scanning speed, laser radius, and so on. Here we set 18 temperature points of thermal conductivity for solid material. Make sure the number of temperature points equals to the number of conductivity points. Then similarly, we define the temperature dependent liquid material property. Make sure this number equals to this number. Then is the thermal conductivity for powder material. Next is the convective heat transfer coefficient for solid, liquid, and the powder material. Next is the uh, specific heat for different material types, and uh, finally the and finally the uh, emissivity coefficient. The above definition is temperature dependent thermal properties and the following is the temperature dependent mechanical properties for different material types like the elastic modulus, Poisson ratio, thermal expansion coefficient, thermal expansion coefficient, and the uh, finally the yield strength at different temperatures. So this this temperature dependent thermal and the mechanical properties can be obtained from a table or from a figure. Here is a table that lists the thermal and the mechanical properties of Inconel 718 at different temperatures. Also, we can obtain this material data from a figure that can be found from other publications. The final step for pre-processing is the preparation of scanning pass file. This file includes the scanning pass of the laser spot at arbitrary time and positions. In the simulation of laser part by the film process from part level, it is not easy to apply the input heat flux into the simulation domain because the laser spot changes rapidly with respect to time and space. Thus, a scanning pass file in XML format is developed to drive the simulation process track by track and layer by layer. The structure of the scanning pass file is defined in this figure. Each layer has a layer node, and there are many scan track nodes in each layer. There are several ways to generate this scanning pass file. For example, if we have the G-code scanning pass, then we can generate a scanning pass file from the G-code directly. However, most of the time, we cannot get the G-code-based scanning pass file. We can only get the CAD model or STL model. Next, I'll show you how to generate this scanning pass file from the geometry model in Rhino using, a, using the Grasshopper script we developed. Welcome to generate a zigzag scanning pass of a part with dimension of 5.6 times 5.6 times 3.5 centimeters. After we open the Rhino, we type grasshopper in the command line here. Then we can start the GUI of grasshopper. 
then we drag this .gh script to the grasshopper. So this is the grasshopper script that is used to generate zigzag scanning pattern automatically. Before we start to generate the scanning pass, I'd like to explain a little bit of this grasshopper script. This is the input vrep, which we will take this part as input, and this button controls the total height of the part, and if it is divided by the thickness, then we can get the total layer number. Here we only show six layers, and this is the length of the bonding box, and that contains the whole part, and this is the number of intersection lines in each layer. Then take a look at these two control buttons about how they influence the intersection lines for each layer. Then these values determine the initial angle of the first layer, and this the, this this value determines the rotation angle of the scanning direction for the next layer. Then this button controls the hatching space between two adjacent scanning tracks, and uh, this button controls the length of the intersection line, as we can see. And the, the button's orange color appears here is because, because we, we didn't import the part model yet. Then let's look at other process parameters that we can set. This is the scanning speed of the laser beam and its diameter, and the hatching space and idle time for each layer. And uh, this this group of buttons controls the template of our scanning pass file. The next, I'd like to show you how the scanning pass file looks like. First, we set the output destination. Right click here, re rename it. And then we connect this output button to the panel. Now, as you can see, this file is empty with only some default settings because we didn't import the part model yet. So next, we are going to drag this STP part model into the Rhino. It is a, uh, as, it, as, it, as mentioned before, it is a 5.6 times 5.6 centimeters cubic part. Select, select this VREP, and then we right click here and set one VREP here. Then at this moment, the scanning pass has been generated already. We didn't see any difference is because we didn't show them up. So, so let's hide this intersection lines. Find the button that contains all the intersection lines. Hide it. Then we connect these two connect these two buttons and show the scanning pass vector. Here we, here we go. We can also check the scanning pass of a certain layer. Here we choose layer two, and uh, when we change this value, oh yes, we need to hide the scanning pass first. Right click, and it. Then we, then when we roll over this button again, we can see the single scanning track as we change the value of this, of this button. Then we hide it and change it back. Then we show the scanning vector again. Then let's go back to here. So let's change the rotation angle for each layer and the initial angle of the first layer. And we can see a different scanning pass when we change the 
uh, when we change the initial angle of the first layer and the rotation angle for the next layer. And finally, let's go back to the output file again, and we can see the necessary process parameters for each layer and each scanning track have been filled into the corresponding place in this XML file. So this is the whole process of how to generate a zigzag scanning path for a part using this grasshopper script automatically. So at this point, we have prepared all the necessary input files. To summarize, in the pre-process stage, we mainly need to prepare three things, cost mesh, material property file, and the scanning pass file. Next, I'll show you how to compile, build, and run a case study using our FE code. First, we open a terminal and then cd to your working folder. If your project folder is located in the example folder of DO2, then in your current project folder type C make blank dot. Otherwise, you have to tell C++ the place where the DO2 is installed. After a few seconds, if there is no problem, you can type make to see whether there is build errors. If there is no error occurs, then it will be a good idea to run this program in a released version by typing make release. And finally, we type this command to run your case study. Here the double x is the number of processors that you want to use for parallel computing. Once the program is started, you can see some output in the terminal to show you where is your simulation and what is the computational cost of each time step as shown in this figure. For the installation of DO2 on your computer, please refer to DO2's website to get more information. At this point, we have finished the case study and obtained hundreds of thousands of output files in .vtu or .pvtu format file. We can use Visit or Paraview to visualize this output files. Here I'd like to just show you how to use Visit to view these files. After we open the Visit, we get the left control panel and the, the right display window. First, we open the files with temperature solutions as we use eight CPU processes to run this case study. Therefore, there are eight output files in total for each time step. Here we choose the .pvtu files that have already merged the solution from eight CPUs. Then these files have been voted. Next, we add the mesh and draw it in the right window. This is a total mesh that contains the active cells and the inactive cells for the first layer. Then we assign the temperature for each node. So as the legend showed, the Blue cells have not been activated, and the color doesn't seem comfortable for our eyes. So here we change the so we change the temperature range and change the display color to the to the this one. Now this color looks much better, but we still can see the inactive cells. So we add an operation with threshold selection to this mesh. Here, if we if the FE type is zero, it means the cell is an active cell. And if the FE type is one, it means the cell is an inactive cell. We only want to see the active cell, so we set both zero here. Now we can show the temperature field very clearly. And if we set the FE type from 0 to 1, then we can see the whole domain, which is not convenient to analyze the output files. And here, 
here we can uh, we can also make some other settings to make this window looks more concise Don't worry. Close it. so this window presented the temperature solution at different time steps second we create a new window and open the files with other solutions similarly we choose the Similarly, we choose the .pvtu files and add the mesh and uh, assign the displacement field to the mesh. Draw it. So this is a total displacement distribution of the whole simulation domain. We just want to see the displacement distribution of the active cells. So you set the FE type to zero. Here we go. Yeah, and the color doesn't seem very very nice. So we change. So we so we change change the. So we change the color table. Then we hide the displacement field. Here we can also assign the norm stress to this mesh by clicking the norm stress. Then we hide the displacement field. And we can also change the color table to another one to make it look more beautiful. So this is a total normal stress distribution in active domain at, at different time steps. Third, we create a new window and open the files with uh, stress solution. Go down and find it. Yes, here it is. Similarly, we choose the .pvtu file, add mesh, and uh, assign the Vermeer's stress field to the mesh. Then we can draw the Vermeer's stress, stress field. And, uh, yeah. and then we can set the FE type to zero in order to just show the active domain. Draw it, and then we can change the color table to this one. So this is a total Vermeer's stress distribution in active domain at different time steps. And finally, we can also assign other results like the plastic string along the XY plane and draw it in this window. Then we can get the plastic string distribution among the active domain. So this is the general process for visualizing the output files using using the visit which is also an open source software here we show the thermal and mechanical solution of a single scan scanning track as we discussed in the previous slide this is the temperature at different time steps and this is the displacement field at different time steps and the Vermeer's stresses and the normal stresses at different time steps. And uh, next I'd, I'd like to show 
some other thermal simulation result. These two videos, videos shows the uh, temperature distribution of this cubic part with uh, 30 layers under different scanning patterns. For case 1, the scanning direction is uh, rotated 67 degrees per layer, and for case 2, a constant zigzag scanning pattern is applied. As you can see, the mesh is uh, adaptively meshed based on the scanning track of each layer, and the solution can be transferred between two sequential layers. And also we can see the, uh, the, the, the mesh far from the heat source is caused and the, the mesh close to the current. So for the current uh, simulation layer is a uh, is, is dense mesh. And finally, I list the related tools that are used in the process modeling of laser powder bed fusion process. So this is our research that I'd like to share with you. If you have any other questions, please email me through this address. Thank you for watching.